So I'm very happy to introduce uh, Professor Alain Blondel from the Université de Genève, who is going to be our speaker today. And Alain had a um, long and uh, illustrious career in particle physics. He worked on both sides of the Atlantic, and he started his uh, master's and uh, later PhD at uh, Ecole Polytechnique, uh, working on uh, neutral currents uh, and uh, uh, other physics in Gargamel experiment at Soren. That was a big uh, bubble chamber which discovered neutral currents. Then he spent some time uh, uh, at Berkeley working on Mark II experiment, the measured lifetime of the B mesons, among other things. And um, later on, he was um, working on the neutrino physics and then on uh, Aleph experiment at lab. Uh, also through the Ecole Polytechnique uh, with a short Soren Fellowship in between. And uh, basically for the lab era, which was uh, from late 80s uh, through uh, 2000, uh, he was the physics coordinator of Aleph for some time and uh, worked on many aspects of Aleph physics and lab physics, including polarized beam. And uh, after the lab closure in 2000, he started at the Université de Genève, where he is still um, uh, is a professor now. Uh, he founded the Neutrino Group there, worked on mice experiment, worked on T2K experiment, was a physics coordinator for T2K uh, experiment for several years. And uh, since about uh, 10 years ago, he started really thinking about the future collider uh, to replace the LHC, and um, this is uh, what we now, now know as FCC, uh, with uh, both the electron and hadron options, and uh, that is going to be a uh, subject of uh, Alain's talk today. And apart from being an excellent physicist, he is also an avid biker and mountaineer and skier, and uh, uh, so he's really, um, his heart is in Geneva, uh, in Alps, uh, in French Alps and Swiss Alps, and uh, he's going to talk a little bit more about this January area and what he wants to see as the next project, which is straddling the border of uh, France and Switzerland. So it's all yours, Alain. Okay, thank you. So here's my presentation. Do you see it? Yes, we do. Okay, so I'll discuss the uh, FCC project, and in particular, the many opportunities and challenges of the first step, which is called FCC EE. Uh, of course, uh, the, what I present is mostly the work of everybody in the collaboration. Um, and I've been, you know, from, from the beginning involved with it. Uh, but now I'm the um, coordinator of the physics detector and experiment side of things. Okay, so this is a view from the top of the Jura mountain, which is uh, behind a uh, side. When you look and what you see in the, in the far side, in the far view is the Mont Blanc and the Alps. And uh, on a clear day, uh, you can see the valley. Most of the time you see clouds. And, uh, uh, but these lines which are there, they never see. Uh, these are just drawings of where the uh, CERN machine, the PS, the SPS, and the uh, LEP LHC tunnel are. And uh, you see also a yellow line, which doesn't even exist yet, which is where the future circular collider would be. What's interesting is that it goes under the lake. You can see here the Lake Geneva on the left of the picture. And then behind it, um, there's this mountain called the Salev. And, from CERN, we don't see it, but there's a valley behind that. And so we can go all around and back uh, with a reasonable um, uh, landscape to make a tunnel through. Okay, uh, the uh, FCC integrated program at CERN is uh, of course inspired by the successful succession of the LAP and LEC. The first uh, yellow report on LAP was in 1976. Uh, and so the LHC is probably gonna last until 2038 or maybe a bit further than that. Uh, and then immediately after that, we want to immediately on, on 
high energy physics particle scales, uh, that means a few years. After the end of the LHC, we want to have a machine up and running as a Higgs and electroweak uh, and top factory, a large E plus E minus collider, uh, as a first step towards a 100 TV hadron proton proton collider with ion and EP options. Now, the two machines are quite exceptional in their own right. That is, I will explain to you what we can do with the electron machine today. And I hope to convince you that it has an outstanding program with quite a bit of discovery potential. And of course, the Hadron Collider is amazing. Uh, the hard stuff, why we don't go directly to the Hadron Collider is because the magnets uh, that would lead us to 100 TV, we don't know what to make today. We don't know how to make one, let alone 100 kilometers of them. Um, the electron collider is based on the principle of the B factories with a separate uh, beam pipes for the electrons and positrons and a, a injector which continuously replenishes the, um, the rings. The beams cross at an angle and they cross in such a way that the synchrotron radiation does, there's, there's hardly any synchrotron radiation in the uh, detectors. I give you here a number of uh, uh, references. The CDRs can be found on the links here and in the uh, European Physical Journal. Uh, there were public presentations of the CDR in March 20. Uh, 19 and physics workshop in January 2020 and recently a physics workshop at CERN November 9 to 13. And you can find many further details in uh, this workshop. Now this workshop was a week ago and there were so many things that I'm afraid I'm not going to make a summary. This talk is not a summary of the last workshop. I will need another month to make a summary of that. Uh, but I, you should be you should feel very uh, welcome to go and uh, browse through these pages. A couple more uh, interesting papers. Do you see my little finger here? Yes, we do. Okay, so that paper here, your question answered, answered is, uh, while the CDRs are mostly technical and fairly um, factual, the your question answers us a little bit more about um, the motivation and also the um, strategic uh, vision behind the FCC. And uh, there's another one which you might find interesting, which uh, uh, discusses further the comparison between circular and linear machines and how they effectively work on different energy regimes and regions. And they play diff they, they have an overlap over the Higgs region, but they, they definitely have different um, capacities. We also submitted a number of letters of intent to snow mass, which can be found in this link here. Okay, now the first step of this machine is here. I think I've already said quite a bit about it. Uh, in the present situation, we have um, two interaction points foreseen and two uh, regions with RF stations. Um, the um, basic principle of the design is that you can, the, you can play, interplay between the number of bunches in the machine and the um, uh, beam power to maximize the energy efficiency. Uh, we have set a limit of synchrotron radiation at 50 megawatt per beam at all energies so that the total, so that two beams is, uh, is 100 megawatt of synchrotron radiation and the total energy, um, the total power of the machine from the, the, the network is somewhere between 250 megawatt at the low energies and 350 megawatt at the high energy. Uh, the machine goes all the way to the CT bar threshold and above, so it can measure properties of the Z, the W, the Higgs, and the top. 
the beam polarization for the energy calibration at low energies, which having fixed a number of mistakes that we made at lab, we should be able to get to a precision of a, a few ppm or below. So 10 minus six. Okay, so this is the luminosity as function of energy. And you can compare with the machine like Click, which is in green. Uh, our machine is the red one. Um, the 100 kilometer E plus C e minus collider in red. The uh, machine that you could build in the LHC tunnel is in purple. It would not be able to go to the top quark. And so you would be missing the top quark mass measurement, which is essential for the electroweak precision measurements. Uh, the Z peak, we have a luminosity of 4.6, 10 to the 36. Yes, you read it correctly. And that will give us in three years, 5, 10 to the 12 Zs. Now, these are very interesting events where you have nothing but a Z, okay, on shell Z. Uh, that's a fantastic, that's a big, big part of the physics is done there. We have 10 to the 8 W pairs, that's for the measurement of W mass and other W properties. Uh, over the whole uh, in, uh, running of the machine, we'll get three times to the eight W pairs, events where there's nothing else in the pair of Ws. Um, at uh, 240 GV, we have to, a million of E plus and minus to Z Higgs. Uh, that we will call the beam of Higgses because we can measure the Z and decide that there was a Higgs in uh, association with it, even if we don't see what the Higgs is doing. And finally, 10 to the 6 TT bars. Uh, and so it, it's really a great energy range for the heavy particles of the standard model. These are the beam, beam parameters. Uh, you can see, the, as I was saying, the beam currents are quite high. They go to above one ampere at the low energy, the Z. At the high energy, uh, the beam currents get smaller. And that's mostly by diminishing the number of bunches in the machine. This number of bunches in the machine at the Z corresponds to a bunch, cr bunch crossing distance of uh, 20 nanoseconds. Okay, uh, I don't go more into details about these parameters. The luminosity is here and the rest is uh, quite uh, straightforward and not so important for physics. The FCC design is based on the uh, B factories, uh, super B factories lab experience with other machines. And um, that makes us quite confident that these uh, parameters are, are quite uh, reliable. There's a bit of hope that we can improve the luminosity by squeezing the beams a bit further. Okay, this is a uh, implementation in the mountains. Uh, you can see here on the right, that's going under the lake. That's the easiest part, really. The lake is not leaking. If it leaked, there was no lake. So there's no problem excavating under the lake, really. The, the main problem is here. There's a little bit of uh, Jurassic Mountain uh, near to Annecy, which might be a bit trouble, but everything else is quite uh, smooth and, uh, and can be excavated. The biggest technical problem was actually be that some of the experimental caverns are quite deep underground. You can see that uh, each of these uh, lines is 100 meters apart. So this, this is, for instance, more than 200 meters underground. This is 300 meters underground. And this is one of those uh, experimental points close to Annecy. OK, the, the civil engineering studies led to the conclusion that the Total uh, time for construction should be of the order of seven years. And you can start installing the machine after four and a half years of construction. That's a sketch on, the, on, the, on this side. This is a sketch of the uh, machine. Um, here you have a quarter pole, and here you have a dipole. Uh, these are the two E plus and E minus. Uh, uh, this is the E plus E minus collider with the two beam pipes, one here, one there. And this is the accelerator uh, in between. Um, 
on the inside of the uh, storage rings. Um, and you have enough space to bring in the magnets. In fact, there's quite a lot of space in that tunnel in the electron uh, stage. It becomes a bit more uh, cramped up when you're discussing putting a hadron collider because it's a big magnets with the cryogenics and the uh, core lines. And this is a, a magnet that is coming in to be put at the end of that one. So you have to have space for two magnets next to each other. So the, the, the dimension has been designed so that there's no safety issue. This is one of the reasons it's difficult to increase the energy of the LHC because uh, there's not enough, really not enough space for, for that. You can see the caverns which have been designed. We have a sketch of an, uh, the E plus E minus detector is here. This is, would be the Hadron Collider detector. Now they realized that it would be more economical to put them both on the same beam line so that you could make slightly smaller caverns. But in any case, the caverns will be quite large and this offers quite interesting possibilities for um, detection of long list uh, particles. All right, the power consumption is here, as you can see, as I said, it goes from 250 to 250 um, megawatt. We are lucky because we're in a region where there's a lot of electricity that goes from France to Switzerland and France to Italy. Um, and in fact, there's one, two, three places where one could um, have the power lines ready to power the machine. Uh, the uh, E plus E minus machine is 300 megawatt. The uh, Hadron Collider, the 100 TV Collider is 500 megawatt. And that uh, is uh, quite uh, straightforwardly possible here. Um, you'll be happy to know that most of this electricity is nuclear, so this doesn't produce CO2. Um, you may not like nuclear power, but it doesn't produce CO2 at least. Uh, what, we don't know what this will be in 20 years, of course. Uh, the integrated cost is here, uh, civil engineering for the tunnel itself is uh, 5 billion Swiss francs. Uh, technical infrastructure is 2 billion, so 7.6 billion for the two. The electron machine at the top included is uh, 4 billion. Uh, the 7.5 billion will be reused for the Hadron Collider and so that the uh, cost of the Hadron Collider after the E plus and minus machine is 17 billion, which is still quite a lot, but one hope to be able to reduce the cost of those magnets with time. Anyway, it's obvious that this is a bit, a little bit beyond what CERN can afford. So the international collaboration is extremely important and uh, the influx of uh, money from around the planet is uh, being one of the first things on the agenda of the Director General right now. It, most of the, a large, the, the majority of the of the funding will come from the Sun budget, but there's there's more there's a bit more that is, uh, quite a bit more that is needed, and so that's that's really the topic of uh, the study for this next five years. Okay, compared to lab timeline. You have the timeline of the FCC here. Um, so the lab timeline extended from 76 to, the, to 2000, followed by the 10 years of installation of the LHC and then 20 years of operation of which LHC is at 64 lines, uh, years total. And here we're starting in 2020. We hope to have uh, the end of construction by 2038, some installation uh, operation, and then another 10, 10 years of installation and 25 years of operation. That's a total of 70 years. So that's quite similar to the um, to the lab, really. Although it, it, you know, when you are here at the start, it looks like a long time, but you know, we are here 10 years into the LHC, and there's still another 18 years to go. Um, the important point in this um, uh, in this plot should be, and it isn't quite right, but this line should be within the 15 years of operation. That is, the uh, 
the development of magnets should be such when, that one is ready to produce them before stopping the plus and minus machine. Otherwise, this, uh, this delay of 10 years is not going to be 10 years. OK, what we have to do now for the electron machine, if you're an experimenter, is set up international experimental collaborations, detector R&D, and concept development. And the first step is being taken now, which is to define the detector requirements. OK, so what, that's what the European strategy ended up telling us. Europe, together with its international partners, should investigate the technical and financial feasibility of a future hadron collider at CERN with a center of mass energy of at least 100 TV and with an electron positron Higgs and electroweak factory. So the Higgs and electroweak factory as a possible first stage. Such a feasibility study of the colliders and related infrastructure should be established as a global endeavor. That's why I'm talking to you today and be completed on the timescale of the next strategy update. All right, so they, this is a very uh, sophisticated group of people who wrote this. Every single thing counts. And maybe the most important letter here is the S. It's very important that we study both colliders in the study, okay? E and EH and related infrastructure. And it is meant to say FCC is the highest priority for Europe and its international partners. Okay, so we'll have to do this and we'll have to do it in international collaboration. So the, the world is big. Okay, the first challenge that we encounter in our uh, en enterprise is why do we need a new accelerator after the LHC? You can imagine it's very easy to convince somebody in Geneva that this is the case because the important the economical importance of CERN is very large. To convince somebody from a country which is a little bit distant from CERN is much more difficult. And we hit that question often. And it's a good opportunity to reflect a little bit about where we are in physics right now. So in a sense, for somebody like me who started doing physics at the beginning of the student model, um, as you were, were told by, uh, by Greg a minute ago, neutrino neutral currents Z were the first occasion where the, the existence of the Z boson was actually felt in 1973, charm particles in 74, 76. And since then, we have disco been discovering all the particles that have electric charge, QCD charge, or weak isospin, just by increasing accelerator energies. The problem is, it was wonderful. We predicted the top mass by precision measurements, and then it was discovered at exactly that mass. And the theories got the Nobel Prize. And then, from 97 onwards, once we had the top work mass in the precision measurements, we could predict the Higgs mass. The last paper from lab said it was 120 something plus or minus 30 or 40 GeV. It was discovered at the LHC, very much at the mass where it was found, where, where it was predicted. Englert and Higgs got the Nobel Prize in 2013. It looks like the standard model is complete. That is, we have all the uh, particles and the radiative corrections are consistent with the fact that it is complete. Now, of course, that should be checked with great accuracy and the Higgs boson, which is quite a special particle should be tested to great precision. But still, it's quite an amazing situation to be at, to have lived through a cycle where this word standard model was born and where the concept was completed. Now, the standard model is very consistent. It is complete. It explains all known collider phenomena and almost all particle physics, except, except for the neutrinos. This was beautifully verified at LEP, SLC, Tevatron, the LHC. The radiative corrections predicted the top and Higgs masses, assuming the standard model and nothing else. And we can even extrapolate the standard model all the way to the Planck scale. You've seen those plots where you have the fact that the universe is 
has been st is stable has been stable long enough and will be stable long enough for us to be happy with the top and quark mass the quark the, the top quark and higgs masses now that's plot which you see from cms in 2018 we will reduce those error bars at the electron machine very much uh, but moreover this is a, a very interesting um, situation to be in. There was one paper I liked very much in uh, 2010. So 2010, that was before the Higgs boson was uh, fine. This, uh, found, this paper by Shaposhnikos and Vetteris explained that gravity seems to be asymptotically safe. The condition is that the Higgs mass should be 126 GeV with only a few GeV uncertainty. And they even go as far as saying, detecting the Higgs scalar with that mass would give a strong hint for the absence of new physics, influencing the running of standard model couplings between the Fermi and Planck unification scales. That means that we have no guarantee that anymore that by increasing the energy, we will actually find particles which are coupled with the same uh, strengths as the particles of the standard model. So we must look in a way which is more, much broader and more, de more detailed and more precise than what we have been doing so far. So the question is, is it the end? Is it the end? We've done all this work. It's beautiful. So why do we want to continue? And the fact is, there are things we cannot explain. And I'm sure that I will mention three which are very well known and which are very well established because they are experimentally visible. The dark matter, the question of why is the universe made of matter and where is the antimatter gone and what makes neutrino masses. In fact, all these things can be related together or not. Uh, that depends whether they uh, universe, the guy who made the universe is a good mechanic or not. But, um, you know, this, these are experimental questions which want a particle physics answer. So these are the questions. There are more theoretical questions than the standard model. But clearly, this is telling us that there's much more to understand. And the question is, how do we continue? Clearly, we can hope for the observation of new particles, but we actually do not know where they would be. We can look for new phenomena, like the case was for neutral currents, neutrino oscillations, or CP violations, where each phenomena, they were not direct discovery of new particles, but they pointed to the existence of new things or deviations from precise predictions. And we had in the past famous examples, the um, influence of Uranus on Neptune was such that the, the, was such that the orbit of Uranus was not as predicted by what was the standard model at the time and Neptune could be predicted. The same thing is true for Mercury Perihelion, which was the first observation of uh, general relativity, the first experimental verification. Top and Higgs predictions from lab, etc., B factories, D minus two, etc., are very precise predictions which might point to the existence and maybe point with the existence of which new physics. So this is the landscape, and our mission is to look for new, mission, new experimental facilities with more sensitivity, more precision, and more energy to explore a broader field. Now, the FCC really, because of its internal synergies and complementarities, is the most versatile and adapted response to today's physics landscape. Right, this is the example of dark matter. You have 90 orders of magnitude for where it could be. The, Little region in the middle is where dark matter could be weakly uh, interacting. This region, the the, uh, the WIMP region. Uh, there could be sterile neutrinos, or there could be some 
uh, axions and super light scalars, but they could be also heavier particles uh, at the level of Planck scale or collective effects uh, as in primary or black holes and so on and so forth. So only 90 orders of magnitude. The same is true for neutrinos. As you know, we're missing the right-handed neutrinos and there is no good argument where they should be at the weak scale, at lower masses, or unification scale or whatever. So these are, these are very important particles to look for. It just happens that the, the right-handed neutrinos are sterile, so they're very difficult to find. Okay, so with these luminosities, we've got lots of opportunities and there will be lots of challenges. This is the run plan. Um, they, uh, this is what is in the CDR. Uh, uh, and it's basically four years at the Z, two years at the Ws to measure the W mass, uh, three years at the Higgs to measure the uh, Higgs width, and five years at the high energy where you have lower luminosities and you can measure the top mass, but also the top uh, couplings and increase the statistics of uh, Higgses. Uh, so I'll start with the Higgs factory part. This is a straightforward good reason why we need an E plus E minus machine. Then the electroweak precision program. And then the Z factory aspect as a place to search for very, very uh, feebly coupled particles and uh, rare phenomena. Now, as you well know, the Higgs, the LHC is a Higgs factory. Actually, there's something like 100 million Higgses have already been produced, which is more than most Higgs factory projects will do. Uh, but the problem is every time you have a production of a initial state going to a final state of Higgs decay, you get a coupling to the, of the Higgs to the initial state, the coupling of the end times the branching ratio which is the coupling to, of the Higgs to the final state divided by the total weight of the Higgs. And we don't know how to interpret those measurements until the Higgs width has been measured. So physics can be done with ratios if you work carefully enough and eliminate the Higgs width. But if you want to know these numbers in absolute terms, you need to measure the Higgs width. This can be done with this production mechanism. You have E plus E minus to Z Higgs above about 210 GeV. Uh, and the observation of the Z allows you by recoil mass, by missing mass measurement to determine that there was a Higgs in the event. As a measure, 10 to the 34 per square centimeter per second will give you 20,000 Higgs Z events per year for a 10 to the seven second year. So if you have a luminosity of 1.5, uh, 10 to the 35, you're gonna have um, 300,000 Higgs Z events per year at the FCC EE, and three years will be en enough to get a million of them. Okay. So that's the type of events you expect. You get a muon pair from the decay and you do the uh, invariant mass. And that might usually 60% of the time is a BB bar pair, but sometimes you get other things. And by measuring the invariant mass, you get a beautiful X peak. That's a simulation that was done in the CMS detector, uh, assuming there would be an E plus E minus collider in it. The total rate for this kind of uh, coupling will give you the Higgs ZZ coupling and the ZZZ final state will give you GAZZ to the fourth divided by the Higgs width and you measure the Higgs width. Uh, so that's the basic method. It's like a beam of Higgses. Now you can also measure all the decay branching ratios of the Higgs that way. Uh, for those you can see, look for exotics and also look for invisible width. Now, this is a comparison of the various projects for what concerns this, uh, these various Higgs uh, couplings. Uh, the branching ratios will be proportional to the square of these numbers. 
and you can see that the the FCC um, and all that part, the top lines are basically the measurements from the plus and minus mass. Now, these are the most, the largest decays of the Higgs, the Higgs to ZZ, the Higgs to WW, the BB bar, CC bar, gluon, gluon, and tau, tau. When you come, as soon as you go to Higgs to mu, mu, gamma, gamma, Z, gamma, and the coupling to TT bar, the LHC is already dominating if you uh, use the ILC, uh, whatever energy uh, version of the linear colliders or even the EE machine, they will be dominated. The muon, the, those rare decays of the Higgs will be dominated by the Hadron Collider measurements. And this will be even more true when you go to FCCHH where you have more than 10 to the 10 Higgs produced. So the real Higgs factory is the Hadron Collider in this case. And they have amazing results for the self-coupling, the, uh, the um, invisible width of the Higgs, as well as this uh, more rare uh, decays. So the combination of FCCE and FCCHH is completely unbeatable for all the Higgs measurements. Um, I had a slide here on the complementarity of circular versus linear, but the thing is very simple. Until you get to 350 or 400 GV, all the physics you could do at the linear collider, you will do with a FCC. When you go above, then you get to specific type of physics. And when you go, and that is true until two, three TV. And at that point, the E plus E minus linear colliders get replaced by the uh, muon collider. One very, very interesting measurement we can try to do at the FCC is this one. We can, because of the high luminosity at the low energy here, you can see in this region, 125, we have luminosity which is well above 10 to the 36 uh, per square centimeter per second. And we can hope to produce enough e Higgs in the S channel to be able to measure the electron Yukawa coupling. Now, it's a very difficult measurement because we need to monochromatize the beams. The width of the Higgs is much smaller than the energy spread of the, of the machine. And so we need to arrange the beams to uh, monochromatize them. And by doing this, we lose luminosity. But um, with the great knowledge of the center of mass energy uh, of this machine and the reduction of center of mass energy, we should be able to extract a measurement at a few sigma level. This may take a couple of years, three years maybe, and we are not completely sure we can even do it. So there's a huge challenge that we have to enforce, but this is absolutely the only place where people think one can do that measurement. For detectors, we have been helped by the fact that uh, linear colliders have um, uh, design detectors based on mostly the lab experience. Um, and so we, are, we just have adapted to the frequency. The, the 20 nanosecond uh, bunch crossing requires uh, special cooling and special uh, geometry if you have a drift chamber. And so this is uh, the, the, we have revisited the all, um, the all silicon tracker um, possibility or the um, a new idea with called idea with a drift chamber with uh, short uh, drift distances. So the two are okay. Now these detectors will work at the ZH machine or the top. They will not. They will probably not work at the Z, both because of the intensity, but also because we have requirements for the precision that we need to, to achieve. The Z peak. A Z peak is a big challenge. Um, this is the most unique, most challenging, and once you get to it, the most promising part of the program. 
a bit of trivia with that kind of luminosity, 230, 10 to the 34 per square centimeter per second, and 35 nanobond of that cross section, you get 80 kilohertz of events with typically 20 charged and 20 neutral particles. All of that is to be preciously and fully recorded, stored, and reconstructed. You don't want to throw anyone away. Now, with three years at 10 to the 7 seconds per year, you end up with 2.4 10 to the 12 experiment events per experiment. That is 5 10 to the 12 events for two experiments. If the processing time is one millisecond per event, this is 204 years of processing and you have to add the Monte Carlo. So just the triviality of having so many good events. There's no background, you don't get junk, but just the good events are gonna be an issue to analyze and process. There's a huge list of physics to do. Um, a, a big table of precision measurements uh, flavor physics with 10 to the 12 Z decays, you get 10, 5, 10 to 12 Z decays, you get 10 to the 12 BB bar events, 2, 10 to the 11 Z to tau tau, uh, et cetera. So there's enormous amount of precision physics and checks of um, symmetry violations. You have also the possibility of observing dark matter as an invisible decay of the Higgs or the Z. Uh, or explore supersymmetry in the LHC loopholes. Uh, more interestingly, discover very weakly coupled particles in the 5200 GeV energy scale, such as right-handed neutrinos, dark photons, uh, action-like particles, etc. Opportunities in QCD, um, the alpha S, the strong coupling complex with a precision of 10 minus 4, fragmentation functions, and one very unique thing is that the Higgs to glue glue decay, well, it's going to be 100,000 of these events. And there's no other system where we have a glue glue color singlet system, which is well identified as such and uh, can be studied. So this is a pure sample of gluon jets with no you know, f complication about the kinematics or whatever. Uh, so this is a, a big discovery. Uh, you know, at the beginning, people were thinking, oh, you're just going to do precision measurements. No, there's a, a considerable amount of discovery potential in that machine. So the line shape measurements, maybe I go a bit fast on this, but if you want to explore the full precision of that program, one issue is going to be the measurement of cross sections. Uh, we can do low angle Baba scattering like we did at lab. This is probably limited to precision of about 10 minus 4. We can do better by using the EE to gamma gamma process. We have so much luminosity, we should get a few 10 to the 9 of those events. So maybe we can get cross sections uh, at a few 10 minus 5 measure, uh, precision. Uh, Statistical incentives on of the order of 10 minus 6 on a measurement like the forward backward asymmetries for muons and also the ratio of hadrons to leptons, which is a very important measurement. Um, the mass will measure by resonant depolarization. Um, the beams will polarize. There's a very nice graph on the on the left from LAP, where we measured the beam energies to 200 kV. We thought this was just incredible. We simulated what we can do at FCCE is going to be about four times more precise each time uh, because the machine is bigger, simply. That ratio of hadrons to leptons is the key to measuring the alpha, alpha S measurement. And uh, we hope to be able to measure it better than one part in 10 to the four. Alpha, the forward backward asymmetry for muons is what measures the weak mixing angle, sun squared theta w effective, and alpha QED as well. The, the intercept at the z peak is giving you sun squared theta w. And the slope of this um, 
forward backward asymmetry with energy is a measurement of alpha QED. This is the Z photon interference uh, in the region of the Z mass. This is exactly alpha QED. There's no integration of hadronic cross sections or whatever. You directly measure that quantity. It's a very interesting uh, part of the precision measurements. Okay. Um, the interaction region has been studied with great precision. One of, so we started working with the accelerator guys and that was one of the reasons why the machine is shaped the way it is. Uh, but we've, we've, the important thing is that we've worked in very close collaboration with, uh, uh, with that group. One of the consequences is that we managed to get it such that the low energy, the low angle dead region is going to be limited to 100 milliradians. That is uh, six degrees. That will allow us to have really uh, good acceptance for e plus e minus to z to hadrons, um, xc, uh, all the all the uh, dead. That space, the uh, the cracks in the detector are designed from the start to be very small. Precision measurements. Here's a table. The red numbers are the statistical precisions. Uh, and the effort we're doing now is to reduce all the systematic errors down to those levels. Okay. It is no. Uh, we make no prisoners. Every measurement we will try to get down to those errors. So we have for the CDR, we gave a list of, uh, of uh, systematic errors, which were our best effort, but this won't be enough. We, we really need to design the detectors to be able to, uh, to do better than that. And the same is true for theorists. There's a group of theorists which has already produced two yellow reports working very hard on reducing the uh, theory systematics to the level of our statistical precision. Now, um, I don't like EFTs all that much, but this is a standard candle for doing the sensitivity of these measurements to heavy physics. And uh, you can see here this table of various uh, six dimension operators. The Higgs ones are the green ones, this, 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 and then this, this, this. The red ones are a electronic precision measurements. And you can see that lo and behold, two things. The electronic precision measurements tend to be more sensitive than the Higgs measurements, but more importantly, they are different. So we're completing the uh, high energy um, the high energy measurements with um, the Higgs measurements with the electroweak measurements to gain um, both more sensitivity and also to be able to levy uh, the identification of possible new physics. You see a second thing, which is that the, um, the theory uncertainties at the present level would limit you to about that precision. And the ongoing work is to push the limit up and also the experimental precision, so that we can push this, uh, we can push up these bars of sensitivity to high high energy physics by the measurements. Okay, so just to give you an impression, this is the the, the little blue ellipse is what FCCE can do. Uh, this is where we are uh, right now. It's called HLHC, but it's really uh, based on the includes all the previous. Uh, uh, precision measurements from the uh, from the lab SLC intervatron era. Uh, you can see what the click uh, uh, run at 280 GV would do. You can see that it's not such a big improvement. The ILC can do better. The CPC can do even better, and the FCCE, which is really really. Uh, where we have the, 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 the knowledge and the tradition of doing those measurements is going to do better. Now, the goal of reducing the systematic errors to the level of statistics should allow us to get down to this uh, tiny little ellipse, which is at the bottom. Um, 
the reach for new physics depends on which new physics you're talking about. Um, if you're talking about EFT type one over lambda square new physics, you go to 30 to 70 TV as I showed before. But for example, a heavy neutrino will take you to 500 to 1000 TV. And um, the new non-degenerate doublet, uh, I, for some reason, it does not appear on the slide. Uh, you can limit any non-degenerate doublet, must have the two, at, at present, must have the two particles have the same mass within 50 or 60 GV. And with uh, FCCE, this number will be reduced to five GV, a factor of 10. Okay, tau physics is also very interesting. I briefly mention it. Um, the idea is to remeasure the for me and the tau branching ratios with the taus. So it's a test of lepton universality by comparing G Fermi, uh, G Fermi from the muon decay and G Fermi from the tau decay. And you compare the muon to electron couplings by the ratio of the pion to uh, E nu to mu nu decay. All right, so the first thing is to measure the tau mass. And there we have a statistical precision of four 10 minus uh, uh, 4 kV on the mass, which is 1.8 uh, GV. So we are discussing a two part per million. Uh, the same, the present level of systematics we think we can do is 0.04, but of course we want to work harder and get the same as the statistical precision. So we need to study that process, study where the errors come from, um, See how we can take advantage of the fact that we'll have 10 to the nine J size to mu mu from Z decays. And the mass of the J size is measured with a precision two PPM from the Novo CPS experiment. Now, maybe they can even improve that. And so, you know, we have to get a virtuous cycle started to beat down the systematic errors worldwide. At the lifetime then, as a very interesting requirement. The statistical error we should get on this number, which is 290 femtosecond, is less than one femtos than 0 0.001 femtosecond. Okay, so we're talking about three ten minus six precision. Now, if we want to match that error. That means knowing the radius of the vertex detector to plus or minus five nanometers. The challenge for the alignment procedure and the stability of the device is something that needs to be investigated. It's, it's certainly possible on paper. It just has to be built to, so that this measurement can be done to that precision. It's very sensitive to heavy neutrinos, etc. Okay. A flavor factory is a story to be written. There's many, many things to study. And in particular, understand whether that physics can be done with the ILC type kilometers, which have a precision of 15% over square root of E, or if you need a crystal type detector with a precision of 3% over square root of E. There's more than one detector, so more than one solution can be uh, proposed. And the big thing, the dark sector. Um, dark sector is the example of new physics, which instead of being at high energies with standard model couplings, can be at lower energies and the, its connection with the standard model particles undergoes either a heavy mediator or mixing. Typical particles are sterile neutrinos and which is mixing uh, by way of the left-right um, helicity. Uh, this uh, picture will be similar for many things. The uh, FCC EE capability for 10 to 12 Zs is this line, okay? This is the low, this is the mixing angle between heavy and uh, the square of the mixing angle between light and heavy neutrinos. This is the CISO uh, model 
calculation, naive calculation for one family. For several families, you can have significantly larger mixing angles. And this is where we can go. The present limit from Delphi is at 10 minus five. We can go somewhere about 10 minus 11. And that's up to the Z mass. Higher than the Z mass, we can still be sensitive to mixing by the measurement of tau decays and all the electroweak precisions. Uh, and that extends up to, as I said, a thousand TV. So this, this is a very uh, important page to be written by the FCC. Same is true for uh, action-like particles. There's this whole domain of uh, sensitivity phase space, which can be covered by the search for a uh, isolated photon, which is not pointing back to the vertex. Okay, so uh, next steps. Well, I'm sorry, I cannot tell you what mandate we got because the CERN management has not written our mandate yet. But we're continuing now on the basis of the mandate of 2013. And some milestones are well established. Um, this is the overall goals of the FCC uh, program as far as the, um, the uh, civil engineering, the accelerator uh, design uh, uh, and all the financial uh, feasibility study is concerned. Uh, and for the physics and experiments, I will come to the uh, detailed uh, description now. Uh, the important thing for us in the physics and experiment side of things is to reach out to all European and international partners. I think that that's an absolutely essential aspect for the uh, European strategy, which will happen in 25, 26. So we are looking for physics conveners. So if you feel like being a physics convener, please let us know. Uh, there's a whole list of uh, physics topics um, and uh, people who have a little bit of experience with organizing such things uh, are highly welcome, but people who just want to work on them are also very uh, uh, on, on, on specific uh, uh, case studies of uh, going from one measurement to be done to defining a detector requirement uh, can come and uh, 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 contact us. Um, one of the goals could be to produce papers for SNOMAS. Uh, a paper per, uh, for each of these studies would be extremely welcome. We have started that work. There are tools available now and uh, you can be happy like a fish in water. Until summer 2021, we want to have this several uh, initiatives in Europe about uh, detector R&D. So you want to make sure that uh, our detector requirements are understood by these people. Um, there's a decision to be made whether the FCC has a design which is compatible with four interaction regions or just two, and that needs to be done by the summer of 21. Uh, FCC week will happen in May or June 21, and then we'll have a physics workshop every winter, typically in January. And we already know where they will be. Uh, our goal is to deliver physics and experiment CDR at the end of 2024. And that should be the support on which the experimental protocol collaborations should submit expressions of interest or even letters of interest for the next European strategy of, I, I expect the submission will be like the winter, the, the Christmas 2025 or the early spring. 2026. Okay, uh, let me skip this. Uh, yeah, the physics landscape. So the physics landscape is here. I said it already. We want more sensitivity, more precision, more energy. And the FCC, starting with the electron machine and then the Hadron machine, is unbeatable in terms of the broad, versatile, and well-adapted response to today's physics landscape. So the job now is to start designing the detectors. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Alain, for this very comprehensive talk and a lot of exciting um, opportunity for near future and not so near future. So now we have uh, time for questions. Please either speak up or raise your hand. I can see. Um... I can see just raise his hand. So Rick, please. Yeah, Alain. <laughs> In, Hello. I think at least, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. At least in your slide that showed the as in T parameters, you showed that the <clears throat> CEPC would do not quite as well as the FCEE. I was wondering what the reason for that is in the parameters of the. Of the ah, yes, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think that's because they may they realize later they started by a Higgs factory, and they were happy with this for a while. Um, but we um, have always, you know, because of the experience on lab, we always had a, a, a knowledge that this was important. And um, the RF system is designed to have a Z phase and a Higgs phase and a Higgs and top phase. So the RF cavities for the Z are not many because the energy loss per turn is only 36 MeV. So it's a it's it's this RF system which has an extremely high intensity, but not so much gradient. Okay, 36 megavolt, but an intensity of 1.3 uh, amp per beam. And so there will be separate RF systems for the electron ring and the positron ring. Uh, with a very high um, uh, intensity, uh, ability to have large intensity, so very little uh, higher order modes or anything. Then we go to four or five uh, RF um, cavity modules for the higher energy, and even for the top, we go to 800 megahertz instead of 400 megahertz. Uh, RF frequency modules, which provide a better gradient so that we can get to the total gradient of nine and a half gigavolts, which is needed at the top energy. But we switch systems. So there will be a set of cavities which will have been built. They're not that many, but they have been built just for the Z. The CPC is using a single system for the whole uh, energy range. Other questions? Thank you. Let me ask one. So when you talked about this Higgs to EE coupling, which is extremely challenging. Um, in fact, uh, since it is so small that radiative corrections uh, are supposed to be the dominant effect, wouldn't you in fact measure the Higgs to gamma gamma coupling via W loop or uh, effectively? Okay, so it cannot be a W loop because that um, couples to uh, that doesn't couple to a Higgs particle. They, they, they uh, electron and positrons would have to be left and right-handed uh, each, and that makes a spin one. Um, you cannot do the, the the gamma current cannot do it either. Um, you would have to have a Higgs and a photon. So if you are just above the Higgs, it doesn't take that much energy, but just above the Higgs, you have a big, uh, you, you start, you get into the Higgs Z, uh, the, sorry, the Higgs gamma production, which is more abundant, but there's a gap. That is, if you are really at the Higgs mass, you're producing only Higgses and, and the photons are, are extremely, do not affect the, the, the Higgs light shape. Um, it comes up a few, a few uh, uh, tens or hundreds of MeV above. Yeah, that was that was the first question. That is, when you look at your decay, Higgs to EE, and that is dominated by the Higgs to two gamma. Okay, right. Be okay, because you get a, a gamma giving two to an electron and positron and an additional gamma. But when you are in direct production, EE to Higgs, there's no gamma. Okay, you need the two electrons full energy 
to produce your eggs. So the key is that you really sitting on the threshold and since Higgs is so narrow, you cannot really have off shell production basically. Exactly. The, the problem that you have, of course, is that there's huge background of E plus E minus to Z gamma. Okay, and Z going to be B bar, or Z going to C, C bar, a pair of fermions. That is a big background. And so the channels that we are looking at are more the uh, Higgs to WW, which at that energy is, uh, is non-existent and with the Higgs has a big uh, coupling to that. That is the, 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 biggest, the, the biggest chance of observing. This is a channel in which the Z doesn't decay um, or not much. Uh, the other decay we're looking at is the Higgs to glue glue. If we can, is there are um, manifestation of the two gluon final state, like each of the two gluons giving a pair of Bs, for instance. Um, this is something that the Z doesn't do. Uh, and so we are, we're looking for trying to enhance the, the signal by such uh, techniques. <coughs> we might even consider using polarized beams because if we manage to produce a spin zero state, then we suppress the, um, the Z production. But as I said, we are mostly focused on the transverse polarization for energy calibration. And so I don't know if we can do both uh, transverse in the arcs and longitudinal in the interaction region. So that, that, that's, a, that's a work in progress. There's a work for task force examining this. and. Uh, if you think you like to difficult problems, uh, you're very welcome. Okay, thanks. Uh, any other questions for Alain? I don't see any, so last chance. And if not, let's uh, thank Alain for this very nice colloquium and for staying late for his dinner. Uh, no, no, it's not yet time for dinner. It, oh, yeah, I guess it's eight o'clock in France, more than seven. But it's seven, you. it's it's okay. Ulrich has another question. I know. Oh, no, I think actually Ulrich I was just clapping. clapping. <laughs> <laughs> Thank right. you for this talk. I was a clapping person. Thank you very much. So that the end. Okay, that, guys. Well, don't, you can you can write me email and ask for details. So. Yes, and we'll okay. ask Alan to send us slides to link them to the website. Yeah, do you have an Indico site where I can put them up? Uh, it won't be Indico, but uh, somebody will contact you. I think uh, Ida would contact you with uh, just right. uh, putting it on our department website. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.